Okay, welcome. Good to see all the Christians here tonight. Uh, Laurie loves her a good schedule, and so tonight we've changed it. Uh, we're going to do all of Hosea tonight. Usually we break it up into two nights, uh, but our guest speaker has promised that he will be on time, and so he'll wrap up, and then I'll finish up the rest of the book. So we're going to do Hosea tonight. Uh, Andrew, are we, I got to pray first, right? But we're all ready to go, right? So when the guest speaker walks in, we'll give them a, a mic and they'll be ready to go. Good, good. Okay. There's all the air going out of my balloon, I think. Um, oh, yeah, six. Lord, thanks for this time together. Uh, we love you. We pray that your spirit would be here and impress this book on our minds on our hearts, and in our spirits uh, for the rest of our days. Would you do that, please? We pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Hosea. If you got to read the chapters, you understand uh, the analogy in this book, and you understand then the word that comes with this uh, beginning of the Minor Prophets, of unfaithfulness. Uh, it'll apply to uh, Gomer particularly and then to the whole nation of Israel which is the analogy that God is drawing. Uh, Hosea wrote it, uh, so he says. His name means salvation or deliverance. Uh, he wrote it, this is still pre-exilic but we're getting closer and closer and closer to 722 B.C. He's writing it primarily to Israel, and why, um, again, as my prophet's professor wrote, through the personal tragedy of unfaithfulness in his own marriage, Jose was allowed to experience something of the heartache God himself felt for his bride, Israel. Um, last time we did this, I had emails from people saying, well, tell me something about the guest speaker, because I'm not sure I want to come, because maybe he's not going to be very good. Uh, some of you may have heard of him, uh, Haddon Robinson. Uh, Haddon Robinson um, actually taught Cody how to preach. Cody took classes from him on how to communicate. So Haddon Robinson is a very famous teacher of preachers. He used to be at Dallas Seminary many years ago. He went to Denver Seminary. He went to Gordon-Conwell. He's with the Lord now. Uh, but he is going to be our guest lecturer tonight on the book of Hosea. So if you will, Dr. Robinson, play it now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Daniel. And then you hit Hosea. He's the lead-off man for the minor prophets. I uh, often have felt that the uh, minor prophets could use a good public relations firm working for them. I mean, who wants to read a minor prophet when you can read a major prophet? In other traditions, though, uh, <laughs> the minor prophets are called the shorter prophets. Now, there's a winner. Most folks would rather have a shorter sermon than a longer sermon, and if they, if they were the shorter prophets, everybody would read them. But at any rate, Hosea is the lead-off man for uh, minor prophets. Hosea chapter 3. The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she's loved by another, and she is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites though they turned to other gods and loved the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and lettuce of barley. 
And I told her, you're to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any other man. And so I'll live with you. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without effort or idol. But afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. Last uh, year has been an interesting year. I have a colleague at Gordon-Conwell Seminary where I teach who got married in December. What's interesting, he was uh, about 45 years of age. And for a long time, it seemed like Scott would never fall in love. He had a young woman that he dated from time to time, but, you know, nothing really serious. And then January, whatever it was, hit him. <laughs> and he really tumbled in love. You could tell it by the way he walked, the way he talked, the way he smiled. And in December, I uh, married him. Young love is always very attractive. On August 11th, Bonnie and I uh, celebrated our uh, 50th wedding anniversary. We took a trip, and uh, on the trip, the cabin attendants discovered that uh, we were celebrating this anniversary. And one after another on the trip, they came up to talk to us. <laughs> one young lady said, 50 years? Man, I, if I've been married seven years, I don't think I can make it to 10. And others came up to tell us how wonderful it was. And, you know, they, uh, it isn't really hard. You just marry the right woman and hang in for 50 years and you make it. <laughs> but whether it's new love or old love, as Wordsworth said, all the world loves a lover. Because I believe that's true. I think that the book of Hosea should be the best love book in the entire Bible. In some ways, the story of Hosea is a little different than a hundred thousand other stories that take place every year in New York or Boston or Los Angeles or Grand Rapids. It's a story of a broken vow and of a broken home, of a broken heart, of a broken life. But in other ways, the story is so utterly unique that it ranks as one of the most amazing in all of literature. Now, we've ignored the story of Hosea. We've uh, cut it from our Sunday school lessons and ignored it in our pulpits. But God has chosen this sad, sordid story of a broken-hearted prophet to reveal his heart and to manifest his love. The setting for the story of Hosea takes place in the city of Samaria. Hosea, a young prophet, is uh, led by God to meet and to love and eventually marry a young woman by the name of Gomer. Gomer is part of the wild, easygoing life of her time. But Hosea brings much to this marriage. He brings the unsquandered treasure of a young man's purity. For Hosea has never sacrificed upon some wayside altar, and as a result, he comes to this a supreme moment of his life with much to give. And I imagine that Gomer must have been swept off her feet by this young man of genius, who had the heart of a hero and the passion of a poet and zeal of a saint. Now, a preacher's life, like any man's, I guess, is blessed or ruined by the woman that he marries. So I imagine that when Hosea first met Gomer, he must have thought she was as pure as the lily of the valley in his favorite love poem, the Song of Solomon. But as the days passed and he grew to know her better, he recognized that her purity had already been taken and trampled under the passions of vile and impure men. Yet it was in a command from God that uh, Hosea and Gomer were married. And so I imagine that Hosea must have reasoned that, uh, all right, even though Gomer's past had been filled with sordidness and shame, I mean, since God had brought them together, their future would be filled with happiness and delight. But he was wrong. Perhaps Hosea did not have the time for his uh, pleasure-loving young wife that he should have had. Hosea was busily engaged attempting to save a nation. 
Hosea recognized that the prosperous nation of Israel would fall victim to the war machine of Assyria unless it repented of its sin. And so he gave his days and nights calling the people back to God in all-out effort to avert disaster. But Gomer did not share the heart of her more righteous and religious husband. She thought things stupid that he thought serious. And as he pouted and persisted, Hosea cared much more for his preaching than he did for her. And so, bit by bit, Gomer drifted back to the old wild life from which she'd come. And day after day, Hosea returned home with a heavier burden than that of a decaying nation resting on his heart. Night after night, he lay awake long after it was good for him, waiting for his wayward wife to return. Now, I'm confident that Hosea must have uh, prayed. He was a godly man. I'm sure he carried his domestic problem to the Lord, and one day it seemed God answered the prophet's prayer. Gomer became pregnant and then gave birth to a baby. They imagined that as Hosea held that infant in his arms, he must have reasoned, this is, this is God's doing. I mean, this little baby will take one chubby hand and put it around my heart, and another hand put it around Gomer's heart. He'll draw our lives together. And he called the name of his uh, son, according to verse 4 of chapter 1, Jezreel. The name Jezreel was the name of a city that had played a tragic part in Israel's history. A terrible apostasy under a king by the name of Ahab and his queen Jezebel had come to a frightening conclusion when that queen was hurled from the window of her palace and her body was devoured by dogs on the streets of Jezreel. So when Hosea called his son Jezreel, He's making the uh, boy and his marriage and his family a, a kind of object lesson of God's relationship to his people. It would be as though a Jew today were to call his son Dachau, named of one of the horror camps where Hitler massacred Jews during World War II. That name sounding in the ear of a Jew today would bring back out of the cemetery of memories grim ghosts of a bygone time. So when Hosea called his son Jezreel, he was making the boy and his uh, marriage and his family a kind of object lesson of God's relationship to his people. Every time he summoned his son at play, every time he called Jezreel in the marketplace, that name sounding in the ear of a thoughtful Jew would have brought back reminders that in the past, God had punished the nation for its sin. And yet, even though little Jezreel was born, Gomer did not change. Oh, I'm sure there were times when she shed hot tears and promised to do better. But somehow the tears were never hot enough, the promises deep enough to make her turn from her wayward way. And then... They had a second child, this time a little girl, and they called her, according to verse 6 of chapter 1, Loruama, which means uh, not pity. And then after Loruama was weaned, they had a third child, a second boy. And they called his name, according to verse 9 of chapter 1, Loami. Loami in the Hebrew means uh, no kin of mine. These names of Hosea's children do a number of things. But one of the things they do is to give us an insight as to what was taking place in the prophet's family. For the name of this uh, third child, lo me, no kin of mine, indicates that in uh, bitterness and heartbreak, Hosea became possessed of a suspicion that became a damning certainty that these children born into his home were really not his children at all. And yet, even though uh, Gomer was living in adultery, Hosea refused to divorce her. And then one day, a uh, second blow fell. Hosea returned home to discover that his uh, wife had left him. Perhaps there was a note pinned to the nursery door. She told him she was leaving. She was tired of being tied down. 
she was uh, going back into the society. She wanted to have her fun. And she was leaving Hosea and leaving the children, and he was not to follow. <laughs> so you can imagine Hosea as he put his children to bed that night. He has to be both a father and a mother to them now. He gives them a bite of supper and then uh, listens to their childish prayers and then watches as they drift off to sleep. But there's no sleep for Hosea. For even though Gomer has left his home, he has not left his heart. And you can imagine how the people in the community must have laughed. I mean, you can almost uh, hear the gossip as it uh, swept over the back fences of Samaria. Preacher's wife has left him. The prophet's bride is gone. And some folks said, well, it serves him right. I mean, he's been telling everybody else how to live. He couldn't hold his own home together. But there were those who knew Hosea, knew Gomer, knew what had happened. Simply shrugged their shoulders and said, well, now that she's gone, she's better off forgotten. But Hosea loved Gomer. And Hosea couldn't forget. Imagine that when uh, Gomer left Hosea, she must have thought she was better in herself. Undoubtedly, she was lured from his side by the promise of exotic food, exciting clothes, a marvelous, fulfilling life. But as often happens with folks who take that path in life, it, it seems to lead up into the height, but it has a way of turning and going down into the depths. At any rate, that's what happened with Gomer. Because after she left Hosea, she passed from man to man until finally she fell into the hands of a man who could not provide for her the basic necessities of life. And all that time, Hosea watched the downward trek his wife had taken. Finally, when he realized she was living with a man who could not provide for her clothes and food, he evidently went to the man and introduced himself. Are you the man that's living with Gomer, the daughter of the blind? The man says, well, what if I am? Hosea says, I'm her husband. The man clenches his fist. He's ready for a fight. And Hosea says, no, no, you don't understand. You see, I love my wife. I love her very deeply. And I just wondered if you could take some of my silver, some of my gold, buy for her the things that she needs. The man stares incredulously at the prophet, but then sees the money in his outstretched palm. He says, well, no fool like this fool agrees to the preacher's plan. You say to me, I mean, that, that's nonsense. I mean, it, it's totally unreasonable, Ill illogical that a man's going to put out good money to pay the keep of a woman who has turned her back on him. And I agree. It's not logical. But the point is that Hosea isn't acting according to logic. Hosea is acting according to love. And love has reasons that reason cannot reason. Love is understanding that understanding can never really understand. For love is of God and it's infinite. And Hosea is playing the part with Gomer that God has played with you all of your life that God has played with me. And so we watch as this uh, man returns home, his arms filled with the good things that Hosea's money has purchased. We see Gomer as she races from the hut, throws her arms around him, showers him with her affection, thanks him for what Hosea has done. You say to me, where do you find that in the book of God? And I find it in Hosea chapter 2, and verse uh, 5. For Hosea says, their mother has been unfaithful. She has conceived these children in disgrace. And then she said, I'll go after my lovers, my lovers who gave me my food and my water, my wool, my linen, my oil, my drink. But in verse 8, Hosea says, she has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain. The new wine, the oil, and I lavished on her the silver and gold, which they used for bear. In some place in the shadows, we see Hosea. 
he catches a glimpse of this woman who fills his heart and watches patiently as uh, she pours out her affection upon this uh, man and thanks him for the things that true love has provided and treachery offers and folly accepts. And yet, if you find yourself sitting in judgment on Gomer, I'd remind you that's the part that uh, you and I have played with God all of our lives. It's from his hand that we receive life's rich blessing. Clothes for our body, food for our table, the very air we breathe. And yet how easily we can thank everyone and everything except the God who's provided them. We can thank our government. We can thank the strength of our own right hand. Everyone except God from whom the blessings flow. And you say to me, but no, it's all very good. But does God really love us like that? And I say to you that everything in the word, everything in the world testifies that God does indeed love us just like that. God gives to us metal in the mine. God gives to us trees in the forest. God gives to the miner a skill to mine the metal, and he gives to the uh, forest a skill to cut the trees. And then when the uh, metal is uh, mined, the uh, smith takes that metal, forms it into a spike. When a tree is cut, the carpenter comes and takes that uh, wood and forms it into a cross. And then when the cross is made, God comes and in the person of Jesus Christ stretches his arms along the beams of that cross and allows soldiers to pound with cruel violence those nails into his hands. And he dies there on that cross for the very people who put him there. For the soldiers that drove the spike into his hands. For the crowd mocking, laughing, jeering beneath the tree. He died there for them. And he died there for you. That you might have the forgiveness of your sins. That you might have eternal life you might have heaven forevermore. This is even our God. And there is none like unto him. And yet even though uh, Gomer was uh, living in adultery, she didn't, and being provided for by Hosea, she didn't change. So finally, in the latter part of chapter 2, Hosea decides to take a different tack. Being unable to draw her to him with the cords of love, he decided he'd break the cords. She had planted the seed of sin that she could eat the bitter fruit. She had planted the wind, she could reap the whirlwind. And so he says in chapter 2, verse uh, 14. Therefore, I'm going to allure her. I'm going to lead her into the desert and there speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And there she will sing as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. That phrase in verse 15, the valley of Achor, You'll note in your margin, in the Hebrew, means a valley of trouble. What Hosea is saying is, uh, I'm going to let her get the consequences of what has happened. And go out into the desert area. I'm going to let her stumble down into the valley of Achor. But there, in that awful, desolate place, I'm going to open to her a door of salvation and hope. What Hosea did with Gomer, God did with the nation Israel. God sometimes does with us. I've lived long enough now to know something of the ways of God with men and women. And sometimes when we persist in our uh, rebellion, persist in our going astray, it's almost as though God took his hands off of our lives. He lets us stumble out into the bleak and desolate parts of life. And 
down into the valley of trouble, the place of uh, broken hearts and broken dreams, broken lives. But it's often there in the valley of Achor that God opens to us a door of salvation and of hope. Well, that's what happened in the lives of Hosea and Gomer. Because when you turn to chapter 3, you discover that uh, Gomer sank uh, lower and lower until she fell into the hands of a man who not only could not care for her, but she fell into the hands of a man who cared nothing about her at all. And that man decided to sell Gomer into slavery. Ancient world, slavery was an established institution. Hardly a city that did not have a time when men and women were bought and sold like animals. Uh, Ancient uh, secular historians tell us that when a woman was sold at slavery, she was often stripped of her clothes and forced to stand before the gaze of the crowd. It was evidently to such a place that uh, Gomer was taken. Evidently to such a place that Hosea was uh, called to go. You can imagine the scene. The crowd is gathered. And then someone notices at the edge of the crowd, there's uh, Hosea. And they say, look, he's come to see her get punished. He will get what she deserves. And Gomer is led up before the crowd and the bidding begins. Uh, someone offers uh, 10 pieces of silver. Someone 12 pieces Hosea says, I'll give you 15 pieces. Somebody else says, well, I'll give you 15 pieces and a, uh, and a homer of barley. And Hosea says, I'll give you 15 pieces and a homer and a half of barley. And the gavel sounds. And <laughs> Hosea pushes through the crowd to buy his wife. Again, you can hear the gossip as it goes from mouth to ear through the crowd. Oh, boy, that's a high price to pay for vengeance. I mean, uh, why not just let her be sold into slavery to some man, some woman? I mean, why put out good grain, good money to punish her? But Hosea does not buy Gomer to punish her. He buys her to redeem her. And so he says in uh, chapter 3, verse uh, 2, So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a half homer, a lettuce of barley. And I told her, you are to live with me many days. You mustn't be a prostitute or be intimate with any other man. And so I will live with you. But Jose is uh, saying to Gomer, look, I, I bought you. I've redeemed you. Now I ask you to be faithful to me. I swear, whether you're faithful to me, I'll be faithful to you. From this uh, great uh, prophecy of Hosea, just uh, two lessons I'd like to lay before you this morning. The first is for those of you who are here who have come to a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And that lesson comes in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 3. For Hosea says in verse 2, he bought her for a homer and a half homer of barley. And then he says, uh, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any other man. So I will live with you. What Hosea is saying is... uh, what you would not do, what you could not do out of your own free will. I ask you to do now because you're a purchased possession. That note that is struck here in the book of Hosea vibrates throughout all the word of God. You pick it up as Peter writes to the congregation in his care and says, uh, you were bought not with corruptible things like silver and gold, bushels of barley, from the vain manner of life you inherited from your fathers, but you were bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. 
Or when Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, Christians guilty of sexual looseness, he says to them, but you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. The lesson from the book of Hosea, the lesson from the entire Bible is simply this, that God does not love you because of what you are. God always loves you in spite of what you are. God does not love you because of what you do. God always loves you in spite of what you do. But when you come to understand and accept how much God loves you, and you respond to him with worship and praise, adoration and service. But mark it down, wherever you mark things sacred, that God does not love us because of what we are. He always loves us in spite of what we are. He doesn't love you because of what you do. He always loves you in spite of what you do. But when you know how much he loves you, <laughs> that governs the way you respond. If you were to give uh, all of your money Christ's cause in the world. God could not. God would not love you more than he loves you now. If you were to give yourself in some benighted place on earth, God would not. God could not love you more than he loves you now. God's love is unconditional. There are no strings attached to it. God just loves you as the sun gives forth its warmth. It's just the part of God to love you. But when you understand how much he loves you, then you respond in worship and praise and service. Hardest thing I know for Christians to grasp is just that, that we are not loved because of what we are not love because of what we do. We keep bringing over from the old life that mentality that, you know, the bookkeeping mentality. I do certain things and then God will uh, reward me. I'll do certain things and then God will show his favor to me. And if you got that taught to us, some of us at home. You may have grown up in a family in which uh, your father never really told you he loved you showed you his approval. <laughs> Some of you grew up in perfectionist families. You know what that's like. You uh, get three A's and a B, and your parents say, how come you didn't get four A's? <laughs> so you work hard, you get the four A's. Your parents say, well, there must be something wrong with the school system. You get A's that easy. Try as you will. You just seem to never approve. You, some of you have, 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 have daddies who are dead to 15 years or more, and you're still trying to earn their love. Well, hear me well. God is not your daddy. God doesn't play that game. God just loves you. But when you understand how much you are loved, unconditionally, then you respond in worship and love and praise and service. That's the first lesson. God does not love us because of what we are. <laughs> Always loves us in spite of what we are. But there's a second lesson. And that's for those of you who may be here this morning who are still on your way to faith in Jesus Christ. And I do not know you as a congregation, but I'm sure that in an audience of this size, there are some of you who in the darkness of the dark night have cried out from the depths of your soul and said, where is God? If he's there, where is he that I might find him? Where is he that I might know him? And the answer from the book of Hosea is God isn't lost. You are. But the God who's pursued you up a hill called Calvary has pursued you through the tunnel of an empty tomb and down the labyrinthian ways of life and has pursued you to this auditorium this morning and taps you on the shoulder and calls you to himself. Dr. Clovis Chapel told of a young businessman in the city of Chicago several years ago. 
who went down to the bluegrass regions of Kentucky where he met and wooed and won a young woman he brought back to Chicago as his, as his bride. They enjoyed uh, three wonderful years together. But then one day in the midst of a sickness and a seizure of pain, the young woman lost her mind. When she's at her best, uh, she was a bit demented, but at her worst, she was a raving maniac. And the neighbors complained, and the young businessman moved from Chicago out to one of its developing suburbs, hoping there to nurse his wife back to health again. One day, the family physician suggested, well, if perhaps if he were to take his young bride back to Kentucky, that something there in the familiar surroundings might restore her mind again. And so they went back to the old homestead. Hand in hand, they walked through the old house where memories hung like cobwebs in every corner. They walked through the garden and down by the river where the first the cowslips and violets were in bloom. <laughs> but nothing happened. There was only that old wild look and finally after a couple of days, discouraged, defeated, the young businessman put his wife back in the car and drove back to Chicago. So driving home, however, he looked over and discovered that his wife had fallen asleep. It was the first deep, restful sleep she'd had in many months. When they got to the house, he helped her from the car and uh, took her upstairs, and she still wanted to sleep, and he placed her on the bed. And then he just sat by her side and watched her sleep. On through the midnight hour, on until the early rays of the sun reached through the window, touched her face, and the young woman awoke. She looked over, saw her husband, and she said to him, I, I seem to have been on a long journey. Where have you been? That dear heart speaking out of days and weeks and months of patient waiting and watching. She said, my sweetheart, I've been right here waiting for you all this time. If you say to me, where is God? The answer is very much the same. He's here waiting for you. Waiting for you to respond with love to love. Waiting for you to respond with trust to promise. Waiting for you to cast yourself with a reckless abandon upon God's grace waiting for you to discover in the depths of your experience what it means to be loved by God according to the unconditional love displayed to his prophet Hosea. But whether it's new love or old love, there's words where it said all the world loves a lover. Because I believe that's true, I think that the book of Hosea should be the best love book in the entire Bible. In some ways, the story of Hosea is a little different than a hundred thousand other stories that take place every year in New York or Boston or Los Angeles or Grand Rapids. It's the story of a broken vow and of a broken home, of a broken heart, of a broken life. But in other ways, the story is so utterly unique that it ranks as one of the most amazing yeah. in all of literature. Thank you, Andrew. Dr. Robinson, interesting sermon. Great sermon. I've probably heard it oh, 30 times. Uh, it is amazing. Uh, Laurie will send you the link. I know some parts of it were hard to hear. If you'd like to listen to it again, uh, there's a link uh, on his website. It's completely free. It's public domain. You're welcome to. What? You have it in the notes? Oh, it's already in the notes. Why am I shocked? <laughs> Thank you, honey. Whew. A 
amazing sermon, amazing book, God using the analogy of Gomer and Hosea to illustrate his relationship to Israel. So let's spend the next 20 minutes just kind of walking through the rest of the book. Uh, he took us basically through chapter 3, so we've got just a few more chapters after that. The big idea of tonight will be renew your vows to your husband. Uh, please note that is capital H. That is Hosea's message to Israel tonight. Uh, renew your vows to your husband, Israel. And so there's basically three great movements in this book. There's Hosea's home. That's the first three chapters. That's uh, the subject of the sermon. And then there's God's courtroom. And that moves into chapters 4 through 10. And then the end of the book, the last few chapters, God's parlor. So we start off in Hosea's home. We go to a courtroom, and then he brings us back to the parlor. Nice southern sort of a thing, the parlor. So renew your vows to your husband. He started off in the sermon uh, talking about Hosea's home. Hosea, the prophet, husband. He's, he's a real person with a real life. Uh, he's not just some fictional character, but this is, uh, this is a real guy who God called to be one of his prophets Gomer, uh, the adulteress, she's been unfaithful to her husband. She's secretly and not so secretly pursued other lovers. She's broken her wedding vows and marriage commitments, and she's broken Hosea's heart. Hosea steps in as a great picture of a redeemer into Gomer's life. He shows Gomer undeserved compassion and love. He redeems her for half the price of a slave at that time. And he gives her another chance to be his wife. Please note, her sins have cheapened her to be no more than a slave. And what he's offering generously for her is the price, is half price. That's how... That's how far down Gomer is when Hosea steps in to redeem her. Hosea cannot fully be her husband until she fully becomes his wife. In an exclusively faithful, loving, uh, when she is exclusively faithful, loving and committed to him, and in light of this kind of love, how could Gomer do anything less than repent and live and faithfulness. So chapter 4, then, that's where we end chapter 3, is how could she do anything less than this? Chapter 4 is the turn, and now God, through Hosea, is going to begin speaking to the nation of Israel as if she were Gomer. So he says, depending on the heading on your chapter 4, my heading in my Bible, says the Lord's case against Israel. So we've made a turn from the personal. We've set the analogy, and now God's going to apply that to the nation of Israel. He said, God says, you, Israel, are Gomer. You've broken your vows and your commitments. You've broken my covenant, and your sins have broken my heart. Chapters 4 and 5, he begins to present his charges against them. He says, you don't know me or even desire to. You neither acknowledge me or honor me, nor are you faithful to me. You share your love and affection with your idols which is the spiritual adultery that that's where he's making the, the case. He goes on in chapter 6 and 7, and he begins to expose Israel's hardened heart. She seems to be repentant, 
but her repentance is insincere. He says, your love for me is like the morning dew. You won't listen to my word. You act as if it doesn't even apply to you. You love wickedness, and the only thing you're really hot as an oven for is more sin. God being very direct with the nation. Through Hosea, trying to stop the freight train that in just a few years is going to lead her over the cliff. So he begins exposing her hardened heart, and then in 8 through 10, he renders or announces his verdict. Assyria will invade and overthrow you. You will be scattered and deported. You will now reap what you have sown. If we stopped at chapter 10, we'd go, wow, that's a heavy book. So God turns it in 11 through 14, and he basically takes Israel back to the parlor. And much like uh, God through Hosea was talking to Gomer, I'm going to take you through the Valley of Achor, the Valley of Trouble, and it's going to be in the Valley of Achor that I'm going to open a door of hope to you. That's what he begins to do to Israel in, in his parlor He says, again, I don't know what the heading of your chapter 11 says. Mine says, the Lord's love for Israel. And so in chapter 11 through 14, God says, though you've broken your vows, your commitments, and my heart, I love you. I love you. Though you've broken my covenant, I will woo you back to myself. God's saying, I will begin again as if we've just met, and I will woo you back to me. He says in chapter 11, I've always loved you. In chapters 12 and 13, he says, I love you too much to let you alone, to let you keep walking this way that you're walking. And he says in chapter 14, the end of the book, He says, I will bring you to myself again, which he will do after they're exiled. So 722, northern kingdom goes to Assyria. 586, the southern kingdom goes off to Babylon. God will bring them back in 536 to 516. He'll bring them back. He will woo Israel back to himself. This is going to take several centuries here to get there. So that's Hosea, 1 through 14. Hosea's unstated implication, in light of such loyal, pursuing, and redeeming love, Israel, how can you do anything less than wholeheartedly repent and live in exclusive, faithful, Loving devotion with your husband, God. Israel has been confronted and exposed, and now God calls on her to return to him. With how I've loved you, how can you do anything else but come back to me and live with me in faithfulness? That's God's plea to Israel at the by the end of the book. It's all through the book, but by the end of the book. Fantastic book. If you've never read Hosea, I encourage you to read it again, multiple times. Well, let's make a few applications here. Renew your vows to your husband. Again, capital H. How does this apply to us? First, spiritual adultery. As Gomer was bent toward adultery, as Israel was bent toward spiritual adultery, so Christian, you and I, the bride of Christ, are bent toward spiritual adultery. James chapter 4, verse 4. God, through James, says this, You adulterers! 
Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. And the lover we pursue most is the world. We love the world. John reminds us in 1 John 2. We, we love the world. James says we become friendly with the world. James says in another place we become stained by the world. Paul says in Romans we conform to the world. Can I ask you and can I ask myself, what are we thinking? Spend our time chasing our worldly lover. We love it for the wealth in quotes, it gives us. And so I've seen people sacrifice their health, their marriages, and their families to get it, to get the wealth offered by the world. We love it for the security, in quotes, it gives us, like a bank account or a retirement fund of some kind. We love the world for the significance, in quotes, it gives us, the recognition, respect, or applause of men. We love it for the happiness it gives us. Happiness, in quotes, I need this or I deserve that. Do I need to remind you the, world, the truth is the world hates us? It's provided nothing for us. It's our unseen God who has so generously given us whatever wealth, security, significance, and any happiness we've ever enjoyed. It's too true that many days we'll thank everyone and everything including the smarts we so cleverly exercised that day, or the strength of our own right arm, or our brains, or our hard work, instead of thanking God and giving him the credit. And in this, how are we any different than Gomer, who thought it was her lover, not her husband, who'd provided all the things she needed and enjoyed? So why do I do this? One, because I don't know God or pursue him. Two, because I don't know myself and how bent toward the world I am. Maybe because I've grown complacent. Maybe because I tenaciously want to maintain my self-will, my self-sufficiency, and my own standard of self-gratification or comfort. Maybe because I'm content with a half-hearted commitment to the Lord. So a question to ask yourself, as I've asked myself, be as honest as you can. You only have to talk to God about this, not anyone else. Is my love for the Lord growing warmer or colder? Really? Where might I have grown complacent in my relationship with him? Have I become content with offering the Lord a half-hearted commitment in light of all he's done for me? Hosea, God through Hosea, calls out Israel, confronted her with the truth, 
therefore the word of God calls us out and confronts us with the truth. Perhaps about our actions from the grossly immoral, things you know are wrong, to the respectable sins, the book I hate. Not only my actions, but my attitudes, self-righteousness, prayerlessness, and ungratefulness from self-sufficiency and self-reliance and desiring to appear rather than to be. When I'm confronted with the truth of God's word, I am exposed and there is a call for change. That's called repentance. In spite of our bent toward spiritual adultery, as the greater Hosea, God, desires to forgive us and restore us to himself, even tonight. Our unfaithfulness does indeed damage our character as well as our relationship with God. And it may result in his discipline for our repentance and learning obedience. But it doesn't prevent him from loving us, pursuing us, and winning us back to himself. Since he does this for us, how could we ever doubt his unfailing love, his gentleness, or his commitment to our good? In light of his redeeming love, how can we offer him anything less than our exclusive love, faithfulness, and devotion, like a new bride being wed to the husband she loves? In light of who God is and what he's done, how he has treated us. And as Haddon Robinson said in the sermon, God has never loved you or loved me because of who I am. He's never loved you or never loved me because of what I've done. He loves me in spite of these things. Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Where do we need to turn around and return to him tonight? Where do we need to renew our vows to our husband, God? Love him most. Put him first. Obey his word only, not thoughts, feelings, or past experiences. Where do we need to recommit ourselves to him tonight? For next week, we're going back to 2 Kings. Read a few more chapters in 2 Kings. We're going to see what happens as we get closer and closer to the end of the northern kingdom of Israel. So read 2 Kings 15, 16, and 17 by next Sunday and see what happens. And we'll get together next week and discuss that. Let me pray for us. Oh, Father, how amazing and foreign your love is to us that you've never loved us because of who we are. You've never loved us because of what we do. But you have loved us in spite of those things. And you continue to pursue us and love us. You can't stop loving us and continuing to draw us to yourself. You are amazing. And as it came out in the sermon, who is like unto you, O Lord? We have no one else in heaven that we look to, 
or long to love more, would you work in our hearts this week? Renew our love for you. Deepen our love for you. Make our love for you wider as well as deeper. We want to honestly be able to tell you we love you. We do, but we want to love you more. And would your love for us continue to quench our love for sin? Would you do that for us, please, as well? We ask you for all these things, knowing that you have in store for us greater things than we could even ask you for or imagine. And we rest in that tonight, your great love and mercy and grace for us in Christ Jesus. Thank you for him. Thank you for loving us, asking us to follow. Please continue to hold us by the hand and let us follow you all the days of our life. We look forward to doing that. And pray for it, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. See you in a week.